It is Thursday, February 12th, and we are about getting ready to do the I'm More Show number 443 with myself, Serenity Caldwell, Peter Cohen, and Ali Kazmusha. Uh, Renee is off in Cupertino getting some much-needed rest, but uh, we are still here to keep the fun going and talk about some of the great stuff that happened in technology and Apple and everything in between uh, for the last week or so. Uh, so, joining me, as I mentioned, is Peter Cohen. Peter, how are you? Good. How are you, Ren? Not too bad. Uh, it's still snowing. Still snowing. <sighs> Snowpocalypse. This is just, you know, I'm so over snow at this point. It's crazy. You know, being a West Coaster, I really liked snow. Like, snow was a thing that I got really excited about. And now, now not so much. Not not with 12 more inches of snow in the forecast. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting some tonight, and then some more on Saturday, and, you know, it's just relentless this year. I yep. think we've been annexed by Canada. It's so bad. <laughs> Don't you guys, yeah. like, live next door to each other? About, like, two hours. It's about, it's close enough in relative distance. Um, that voice you just heard was Allie Kazmuch. Okay. Allie, how do you say your last name? I've never actually had to pronounce it. <laughs> Kazmuha. Like Kazmuha. Muha. Okay, cool. Close enough. Yeah. Allie, who are you guys are also getting hit by some snow, right? Because I read something about yeah. your grocery store being decimated. <laughs> yeah, and that's what happens here every time. And we should be used to it. We live right on the edge of the lake. But we were supposed to get like seven inches. We got like a slight dusting and they canceled school. Of course. So, I'm not going to complain because that means they all have to go to school till the middle of June. And they can get off my lawn and out of my pool. So... <laughs> They will my be kids, clogging up. At this point, I'm pretty sure that my kids are going to be going to school straight through June. Yeah, um, I think it's about the same here. You know, it's just craziness. Yeah, there's talk. I mean, Somerville shut down uh, schools until the end of February, uh, which is to say they shut down schools for this week, and then they have the pre-planned February break. But still, school has basically been shut down most of February, so I don't know how they're going to deal with that. Oh, boy. Yeah. But uh, as interesting as the weather is, uh, there you know, uh, things in technology happened this week. Apple happened this week. Um, and, of course, we're still sort of reeling from, um, from the photos beta that's floating around. Uh, Renee and I talked at length about it last week, but uh, since you guys weren't around, I want to sort of pick your brains a little bit just to start. Um, Allie, Peter, you both are, are playing with it right now. Allie, how, how do you like it so far? Um... I think it's a good start. I think that there's a lot more granular control that needs to be added over time, but I think it's all part of integrating a workflow between iOS and OS X, and I think both of the controls have to be there on both sides for that to make sense. So um, I have a relatively, or not relative, I have a very large library. So I'm experiencing, experiencing some of the same pain that I've had with iPhoto in the past with lagginess. Right now I'm just going to blame that on beta, um, but I hope that that's something that they work out uh, just because it's, it's been a pain point in iPhoto for years. So um, I think it's a good start. I love that I can edit a photo on my Mac and have it be edited on my iPad or iPhone and vice versa. Um, there are just certain things that I think still need a lot of work. For sure. Peter, how about you? Um, I'm certainly not the power user that uh, that Ali is, but uh, you know I've I've migrated over my my photo library at this point as well, and I've been pretty happy with it so far. You know I think that that Apple's initial goal with Photos for Mac is to make it as much like the iOS version of Photos as possible, and to that end I think they've succeeded pretty well, and they've kept the user interface you know consistent with the, um, you know, sort of austerity that we're, we're now getting accustomed to with Yosemite. So to that end, it's good. You know, where I would like to see them grow um, uh, photos in the future is maybe with a bit more pro-level features. Um, you know, some of the stuff that, that we're going to miss once Aperture is no longer uh, part of the Apple ecosystem. Um, you, things like uh, support for external editors, for example, to make it that much easier for people who are doing... Uh, you know, photography as part of their workflow um, to, to manipulate images and external editors. That seems to be kind of important. Um, and it's not something that Photos really manages that effectively right now. 
So um, that that would be something that would be on my list. But you know, in terms of using it and getting used to it, I haven't really had any problems. And it's also caused me to switch over um, to um, the iCloud uh, uh, photo library, which I hadn't been using before. So I I finally took the plunge. Taking the plunge, yeah. I am. Um, I I too am running it, although just on one of my computers, on my on my laptop, and only with a subset of my library. Uh, but overall, I'm finding it really really awesome um, and very speedy, at least for these small amount of photos. Again, I haven't. I don't have my full library on it, so I can't say for sure if this is going to be as speedy as the final releases and also beta. Uh, but for the small subset, fo- for the couple thousand that I have, it's much speedier than iPhoto. And just in general, I feel like individual tasks feel a lot snappier um, than they did. Of course, Apple um, Apple reiterated this week that they would not be keeping Aperture around in the Mac App Store once Photos for Mac is officially released this spring. So if you have a real hankering to hold on to Aperture and you haven't purchased it yet, you might want to, but I don't, I don't really see... I, I can't see anybody at this point purchasing a, a Denon product uh, when there no. are things like Lightroom available. And Pixelmator, and mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of other editing tools that you can use. Yeah, Aperture was like a library organizational tool too, but... I feel like there's a lot of other options that people can use. I think for most users, most of the time, the consistency that the Photos app brings between iOS is what's going to be the killer feature about that. Yeah, that's what really sort of attracted it to me. I've been keeping all of my photos in Dropbox right now, and that's good from an overall, I just have all of the photos there, and I know they're existing, but from a management perspective, it's it's Sucks. impossible. Yeah, exactly. Carousel is a nice... Carousel is nice from a, okay, I know that I sort of took these photos back in 2012, maybe I can find them, but there's no real way to organize them, there's no real way to, to take out dupes, it's, a, it's not the best. Yeah, I, I've tried using Carousel in the past, and I just would get frustrated with it for one reason or another and just kind of give up on it. And I think photo extensions in iOS 8's made it a lot easier, and the, it's made the Photos app a lot nicer, where before I maybe necessarily didn't mind toggling between apps because I had to do it anyway, where now I don't really have to, so I don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. And that is something to note that when um, when Apple first announced that Aperture was going to be end of life and everything was going to be shuttering and Photos for Mac was the new uh, the new standard. They did say specifically that um, there would be a way to basically use your use third party plugins and integration with external editors. That's not currently available in the Photos developer beta, but I'm really hoping that we'll either a see it in time for the Photos for Mac release or we'll see it shortly after, maybe at WWDC this year. Because it's you know it it was something that Apple specifically promised, so fingers crossed we'll actually see it show up in the in the near future. Now, and that would mean like if I could pull Pixelmator functions into the Photos app and use one app to control everything, that to me would not really leave a void for Aperture. Yeah, um, so. I I completely agree. Where it's like I. The thing that interests me the most about photos is the organization factor um, mm-hmm. and being able to, you know, accurately keep all of your stuff together and label it accordingly. But I also like being able to edit in external editors and edit programs. So being able to combine those two, I think, would be really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. In semi-related news, we got we we heard very little um, about photos outside of those sort of pre-released things, but uh, but Tim Cook did uh, did get up on stage earlier this week to talk the Apple Watch and a bunch of other things at the Goldman Sachs conference. Um, about 5,800 words worth of stuff, uh, which I ended up transcribing this week. Uh, but it, he had some interesting things to say. He talked about a new solar farm that they're, uh, that uh, Apple is uh, building together with... Uh, Peter, do you know offhand what the company... I want to say it's like Sun First or... I do not remember. I'm sorry, Ren. That's all right. I can I can find it while we're talking. But um, committing $850 million, which is pretty crazy, and they also released their supplier responsibility report this week, which details all the other stuff they're doing to, to make sure that the companies that they're working with are on top of it um, and really uh, doing as much as they can to, to produce green initiatives for, for the technology that they're using. Um, Ali, Peter, both of you guys have followed Apple for a while. Um, in terms of 
uh, how this, you know, how the supplier responsibility and how that curve is increasing. Do you think Apple's doing enough? Too little? Too much? I think Apple's really transparent when it comes to their uh, when it comes to their suppliers. They're certainly a lot more transparent than most other consumer electronics companies. Um, so to that end, they, they deserve a lot of credit. Of course, that transparency comes at a cost, which is that. Um, because they're so transparent about it, they, they open themselves up to criticism if they're not doing as good a job as somebody with an axe to grind thinks that they shouldn't be doing so or should be doing. So, you know, we've seen that kind of backfire on Apple in the past as well. But one of the the the, the points that I picked out of the uh, the the supplier responsibility um, report this time around is that they've got uh, some smelters that are on the chopping block because um, the smelters couldn't guarantee them that the minerals that they were getting for, were from conflict-free zones. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it's good to see Apple um, carrying that social responsibility through all parts of their business and demanding it from their suppliers as well. Um, I wish that more companies would take Apple's lead and would offer the same kind of transparency that Apple does. Yeah, I, uh, I very much agree. Uh, their supplier responsibility report, I've been reading it um, pretty much since the first one came out a couple of years ago, and I think they do a really good job kind of laying down um, what they're working on and what they still need to improve in, which I think is really important. It's not just kind of a grandstanding, like, look at how great we are as a company, but it's very much like, yeah. hey, we need we need these things to improve. We're not there in these areas. And I did think it's interesting. Um, the solar farm is being uh, co co built by First Solar um, in Monterey. They uh, Tim Cook at, at Goldman Sachs. He he inserts a little bit of uh, at the end of his talk about the solar farm, where he's like, "I know this is a financial conference, and I sure some of you are interested in well, is that a good use of funds or not? And you know, quite frankly, we're doing this because it's right to do. But you may also be interested to know that it's good financially to do it. We expect to have a very significant savings." And he goes on to talk about how the renewable energy is actually boosting the business. But I thought that was a that was a good sort of point to, to stick in at the end there, basically being like, I know you guys think, uh, you know, we, we might just be doing this for hippy-dippy reasons, but it's actually good business sense, and it would be good if more businesses kind of hopped on that train. Yeah, and Apple's in the unique position of having enough money to be able to do it. I mean, you know, they, and but the, the, the other thing is, you know, they're her big energy user. You know, they run these big data centers. Um, they've, they've got uh, the, this big new uh, corporate headquarters that they're building. Um, so anything that they can do to reduce their their uh, their carbon footprint, I think, is a really good thing. Uh, it did uh, generate some, some, uh, some complimentary um, uh, comments from Greenpeace, which has really been on their back um, over the years about uh, their various use of chemicals and... Uh, you know, at one time their carbon footprint as well. So um, I, gen, Greenpeace has generally been pretty complimentary to them um, over the past couple of years, but still it's good to see, you know, an environmental advocacy group that uh, um, some people anyway hold in high esteem, uh, you know, lauding Apple for doing the right thing here. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely. I, I I've seen some of the reports in the past where Greenpeace is like, Apple, you're just you're not accept. You know, you can laud all you like, but these things are still not not great. So being able to actually have them stand on the opposite side and say, no, th this is actually you know, good show. It's a it's a nice change. Um, speaking of of things that uh, Apple is kind of doing that are apart from the rest of the community, uh, during the Goldman Sachs con uh, talk, Tim Cook spent a fair amount of time talking about uh, why they don't collect Apple Pay shopper data. They've gotten into, you know, their pundits on both sides kind of going, well, you know, it's great because they're not taking personal information, but also there are the people who are like, oh, loyalty cards, you know, you can't, big stores are never going to get on board if they can't get this data for their loyalty cards and, and uh, marketing programs. And it's funny to me because you look at this in comparison to something like um, Newsstand where Apple did eventually kind of buckle and allow a certain subset of data to be sent to publishers who built newsstand apps, um, but they seem to be holding very, very firm on this. And Cook has a, a whole section about how he, he really, like, it's none of his business what you're buying or when you're buying it or how frequently you're buying it. And they, Amazon and Google are never mentioned by name, um, but it's it certainly seems to be the, the implication. I don't know. What, do you, what, what are your thoughts on, on Apple Pay uh, sort of restricting information um, that the retailers can get Allie? Um, I'm on board with that and mainly because of the fact that I like privacy and 
I know it's it's always been a tug of war game with a lot of retailers, but I stopped shopping at some of the places that you know wanted to go to the currency or whatever that's called. That you know I think it was what Walgreens and Walmart and a couple other places. That awful QR code, yeah. I understand Google's business model is based on collecting information. That's not a secret. Everyone knows that. A lot of companies are like that. But in terms of my shopping purchase history, um, I think a similar thing. It's kind of the same thing when Apple took Siri queries in-house or pulled Google search or whatever. Apple submits the query so it doesn't go through. Google has no way of knowing who's making that query. They can't link it to an account. It's kind of the same type of protection, and I appreciate that protection on a consumer level. So I'm kind of on board with that, and I agree with the stance that Apple Pay is their product, I think, which is one of the things he pointed out, not collecting your data. That's not their business. Their business is Apple Pay and the service that it offers. So they take a small amount to be able to run those transactions. That's their product, not collecting your information. Yeah, for sure. I am I am definitely on board um, because, again, privacy, like... I uh, in the past I've had kind of a cavalier not a cavalier attitude but more of a like if I am doing something on the internet I it's it's pessimistic I, that somebody is going to end up getting my my data like I just I just have to assume that anything I put on the internet is potentially hackable yeah. or retrievable by by thieves um or or by companies for that matter um so it it, it really is nice and like it's it's unexpected um because it, it like it is something that I've I've almost gotten used to not having freedoms in that regard, uh, and to see Apple fighting so valiantly for it, um, and you know there are there are tons of retailers that are signing up from Apple Pay. I mean, one of the other main focuses in this in the conference was Cook really really hammering home the fact that like he is absolutely astonished. Everybody at Apple is astonished how quickly Apple Pay has grown in the last couple months. I mean, it's really only be ru- been running since what November. Um, mm-hmm. So we're we're really only talking about three four months of of active usage here during the during the shopping holidays, which is a tough time to get anybody to transition. So the fact that they have most of the major banks on now, um, I keep on seeing them add new banks every every week. What JetBlue is uh, added mm-hmm. it, and um, Peter, I know you're you're excited about this. Um, Starbucks is going to allow you to reload things with Apple Pay now. <laughs> yeah, now this is actually a really good point. You know, it's something important to differentiate. You can reload your card with Starbucks. It doesn't mean that you are with Apple Pay. It doesn't mean that you can actually pay for stuff. Uh, with Apple Pay. It's still going mm-hmm. through your card. You still have to have your card up and they still have to scan it using their little barcode scanner. But, uh, you know, now now it's a, now it's as easy as, as Panera, which I did for the first time last week. I finally had an excuse to go to Panera um, and I used uh, Apple Pay to, uh, to pay for it with the Panera app. And I, I, I was in, I was out, I got my food. I didn't have to deal with another human being at all. It was kind of the perfect consumer experience. It's kind of the same deal as like when they showed off Target, for those that aren't understanding how Starbucks implemented it. When they showed off Target at uh, WWDC or whatever they showed off Apple Pay with Target, it's basically just an easier way to pay to reload your card. So instead of having to enter details or enter passwords, you can just use your fingerprint to reload. So whatever payment source you have on there, same way you can buy things in the Apple Store app as well. You just can use your fingerprint to validate a payment. Yeah. Now, this was a pain point for me, reloading my Starbucks card, which I've done, you know, an infinite number of times. Um, I, somehow things would always get screwed up, and I'd always have to re-input the data, and I could, I could never get it right on the first try. So, you know, I, I remember last summer sitting there in the parking lot, you know, the, in, in high summer, sweating, <laughs> trying to get my card reloaded so I could go in and get a frosty cool drink. Uh, so now I can just use my thumb to do it. Bonus. Excellent. Here's my. Ours was never. Um, we never had issues with the app, but I don't ever realize I'm running low on credit until we're in the drive-through, and then I'm like, oh, I only have a dollar left. And Heather's <laughs> sure. Of course you do. Of course you have a dollar left. <laughs> so for me, it makes it now I don't have an excuse to, you know, can you pick up Starbucks because my card has a dollar twenty-two left on it. Mm-hmm. So and now I can just use my thumbprint and type in any PayPal passwords or anything like that to reload it. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate this from a, you know, Starbucks may not have the infrastructure to implement full-on Apple Pay readers yet, but by implementing in-app Apple Pay, it basically allows you to, again, it's one more retailer where you can theoretically leave your wallet at home. 
Now, I I haven't yet, I don't know if either of you two have, but I haven't yet tried to go out on the town with just my iPhone because there still are so many places where I'm like, I'm going to need a credit card to, like, get gas uh, so that I don't I don't feel comfortable just leaving the house with my with my phone but it's getting a little bit closer and I'm kind of I'm kind of crossing my fingers that like a year from now two years from now assuming that Apple pay keeps on going up forward and doesn't get any crazy security snafus we might see more and more retailers kind of jumping on board yeah I'm I'm comfortable basically leaving my phone or my wallet at home to like go to the gym because I, I go there and then like go to Starbucks or like because that makes so much sense yeah but I earned it but, oh yeah you know, I mean either way I'm not comfortable leaving I don't think you really can I, which is kind of ironic because a lot of countries outside of the US are a lot more advanced with NFC and how they take payments than the US and we're the only country that it's available in so um, a lot of places by us don't really have gas stations seem to have like the NFC readers now, but I don't think enough of the places that I go to on a daily basis um, accept it to really justify leaving a wallet at home yet. I'm in the exact same boat as Allie. You know, I, um, uh, I've said before, I think I've actually said on the show before that, uh, that um, Unfortunately, most of the places that I do business with um, aren't set up for any kind of NFC payment and don't take Apple Pay in particular for those that do. Um, so, you know, I, I think that Apple Pay, uh, there's a big push to, you know, to see it used more, and uh, I'm glad to see it sort of spreading its tendrils out, and I'm sure that by the end of the year, the landscape is going to look very different than it does right now in February of 2015, but... Um, at the moment, it's not something that I could that I could do simply because I don't live in an area that's populated with enough places um, where you can use Apple Pay. Um, you know, outside of some special some some special circumstances. You know, if I wanted to go to Whole Foods, well, you know, I'll kick it. I could go to go to Whole Foods. If I wanted to go to um, uh, Walgreens, okay, I could do that too. But uh, you know, in terms of like going out for a night on the town, nope, I still need my wallet. Although, you know, going out for a night on the town, I find more excuses to use my iPhone now than um, than I ever used to. You know, whether it's calling Uber or Lyft and getting a, a ride someplace if I happen to be in Boston and don't feel like driving, um, or you know, pulling up Passbook and um, using uh, boarding passes, you know, for for flights or. Um, uh, concert tickets. You know, I've got a lot of. Uh, you know, Passbook is is sort of becoming my my uh, my my shoebox full of concert ticket stubs uh, these <laughs> days. Is an interesting beast to me because I will go through phases with that where I'm like, boom, I have so much crap in there, I can't even keep it organized. Like especially like when we're traveling, and then there's like it was kind of like this gradual thing where I felt like I didn't use it for anything, and then it was like, bam, like I use it for so much stuff, and I don't really know when or how that happened, but but that was kind of odd. Um, so I think thing... we're, we're all going through kind of a social experiment here, yeah. you know, as, as we sort of retrain ourselves to use these, these devices more. With Apple Pay, I think, too, it'll be interesting in communities that have a lot of small business. I'm not really sure how that, like, we have a lot of small businesses where I live, so that'll be interesting to me to see. I think that's going to be a hurdle for Apple, um, and that's going to be when they release this in Europe or other countries where the U.S. is full of a lot of big business and chain stores. You don't necessarily see that in every country, so I'm interested to see how Apple's going to tackle that hurdle in communities and countries that don't necessarily have huge chains to market to. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, as you know, I, I spend my weekends working at a uh, an Apple authorized retailer, and ever since Apple Pay made its debut, we get questions from a lot of customers, especially the ones who come in with iPhone sixes, going saying, "Do you take Apple Pay?" And the fact is, we don't. And it's because our point of sale system, you know, is not the same as Apple's retail point of sale system. We don't have a mechanism for taking for for ex, for accepting Apple Pay right now. And yeah, it's a work in progress. It's something that the owner um, is certainly interested in implementing. But uh, there's an infrastructure cost with that, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of replacing the card readers that we've got with NFC readers, and in terms of, you know, making sure that the transactions are secure and making sure that our point of sale system on the back end is working with it. 
that's a, a hoop that I don't think a lot of small business owners are willing to go through just for the convenience of using Apple Pay. So it's something that merchants, um, you know, banks and and uh, uh, you know, companies with the point of sale systems are going to have to address at some point or another uh, to try to make it with Apple. And you know, Apple's going to have to work with them to make this uh, technology as ubiquitous as possible. And it's only then that I think you're going to see a point, you know, that inflection point where all of a sudden you can go out with just your phone and not have to worry about bringing a wallet with you. What do you think like about developers it? with Passbook? Yeah, and also um, I think about like 15 years ago when you know my father my father was on the cusp of I'm only gonna bring plastic everywhere and my mother was always the one who was like I'm gonna keep a, a wad of cash because you don't know there are plenty of places that are cash only and where you can't pay with your credit card and it's it's not gonna it's not gonna work I kind of feel like it's almost that yeah. that kind of fight um, I almost wonder if Square or one of the um, one of the reader startups is going to invest in trying to do some sort of NFC reader along with their swipe reader and make it I easier for everybody. I think Square already does. I think they're European. I'm pretty sure that they support some stuff in Europe. I read something that they have readers that can read chips. Oh, yeah, like yeah, the... chips, and, chips and pens. They can... Yeah, so I, I almost wonder, I mean, if that could be. I mean, because if they can put a chip reader in there... Yeah, it's just. I think it depends on how expensive it is to to yeah. put it all together. I mean, one of one of Square's big things for a long time is that the reader itself was not that expensive, um, and in fact free for a while. If you if you uh, mm -hmm. sent, a, sent a basically a self addressed stamped envelope to the company, um, but we'll we'll have to see. But it would, I, I feel like that would be that would be a good way to to work into the small business market is maybe Apple goes to Square and is like, hey, why don't we partner up on this? Yeah, yeah. Or Apple might make their own reader. I don't know. You never know. They can get NFC chips in bulk, obviously, so it might make sense. Yeah. Well, there's speaking of of things that um people think Apple might be doing. Uh, last year or last week there was a. Uh, that there was a report on a, a strange-looking car from Apple um, with a bunch of cameras all over it. And the, the vast sane majority is like, uh, yeah, that's probably a mapping car because they want maps to, you know, not uh, not be so terrible in certain areas, uh, which I think is a is a laudable, uh, laudable hope, and I, I'm hoping that, that that works out. But um, there's another subset of people who's like, no, that's not a mapping car. Apple is investing in car technology. That is their next big thing. Um, and I laughed a lot at that. And then I saw yeah. a bunch of people here, uh, a bunch of people on Twitter and elsewhere being like, well, this is, d this is dumb. This particular rumor is dumb. But Apple getting into cars... They did. It's called yeah. CarPlay. <laughs> they did. It's true. It's true. It's called CarPlay. They are in cars. They just may not be making a car. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think they're, if they're going to make a car, I don't think they're going to make a car anytime soon. I feel like uh, whatever we saw was prob almost definitely a mapping device, and, like, there are, there are potential hypothetical reasons for Apple to get into car manufacturing um, in terms of, you know, uh, hypothetical profit boosting and growing and expanding their business, but... When you put the reality cap on, it's like Apple wants to focus on a distinct subset of products. Uh, most of their products involve things that you can either put on your desk or put in your pocket. The only part of a car you can put in your pocket, respectively, is are car keys. So unless they're making a Jetsons car that you know can poop from a square, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I think it would make more sense for Apple to partner with an existing car manufacturer than to make their own cars. Mm -hmm. So I would see that happening before. If Apple really wants to deeply integrate their products, I think that the route that they would take would be to work with a manufacturer or multiple manufacturers, which is kind of what they're doing with CarPlay. But yep. the problem with the automotive market is they're every car manufacturer does things differently. I mean, we've dealt with this for... Um, months with the hands-free link with Honda and CarPlay and trying to figure out and you go to a dealership and you're like okay well can we upgrade to I don't know they have no idea so I can see that pain point and frustration so maybe it would make sense for Apple to have their own ecosystem but I don't think that's the way they would go about it at least not now 
Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of unravel this rumor and, and understand what's going on. First of all, there's the the Apple uh, car thing that has been cited that may or may not be related to mapping, whatever. Then there's this other rumor that Apple is 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 working on a car of its own, and that's come out um, not for that reason, not not because of anything related to the the car with the weird stuff hanging all over it. Because uh, if I remember right, that was just like a Dodge Caravan or Chrysler Town and Country or something with some weird apparatus yeah. on it. Um, this this rumor has has sprouted. It, it hasn't come out of whole cloth, but it's sprouted because. Um, Apple and Tesla have had some friction um, over the course of the past year or two uh, in terms of hiring people. And apparently Apple's made a strong um, play to hire away engineers from Tesla. Tesla, of course, is Elon Musk's um, electric car company. Um, so for whatever reason, there's something about the Tesla engineers that Apple is attracted to, whether or not that is because they're interested in their automotive uh, um, uh automotive uh, engineering expertise or uh, just because of their engineering expertise or their uh, understanding of, of electrics or high capacitance electrics I guess is 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 open for debate and is open for um, you know for for discussion um, but it, it is clear that there's some friction right now between Apple and Tesla Elon Musk has talked about it um, you know he's been asked about it and uh, um, it's just kind of interesting to note, you know, that it seems to be that Apple is poaching uh, from that particular well for what reason? It's unclear. But, you know, could Apple build a car? I'm sure that Apple could build a rocket and send it to Mars if it wanted to. You know, Apple's got billions, you know, available to it. But whether or not it actually would is a completely different question. I guess there are some things about the automotive industry that that uh, would make it appealing for for Apple. You know, uh, the automotives, you, you can get into it and get a small percentage of the market and and rack up some pretty significant uh, income, some pretty significant revenue. You know, that's that's a good place for uh, for Apple because that's really kind of their 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 strong suit, right? Is is uh, making a lot of money with small percentages of the market. They don't necessarily own. Uh, the the computer market, but they do have a, the biggest chunk of of profit uh, that they're making compared to other uh, computer manufacturers. So it, it, you know the same exists for phones as well. They don't sell cheap handsets, but they make a lot of money off the handsets that they do sell. So um, you know is 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 that a potentially right market for for exploitation or for reinvention? You know that that. That to me is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that Apple is going to release a car. Uh, no. You know, anytime in the near future, I don't think that an Apple car is something that needs to exist. But I would love to see Apple technology better integrated with the cars that are available. And I'm not just talking through CarPlay either. I'm talking you know, about, as a whole. And yeah. yeah, it seems to me like Apple goes out that have fragmentation and don't have a lot of consistency where they see an opportunity. And I see CarPlay being maybe an entryway into that, but not everything. That seems like a beta one or an alpha one to what could be. And I, I can see Apple's appeal in wanting to work on a on a factory level structure with car manufacturers because what phones or iPads are people going to buy if it's integrated into their car to the point of being at a at a sub level that low? So. It seems like it's a market area that would be worthwhile over the course of time, but I don't think it's something that we're going to see in the next year or two. Um, I mean, I just think that all of the audio, video, everything that goes along with a car in that standpoint as to how they connect to smartphones and our devices now, it's so fragmented, and no one knows what's going on in that aspect typically. So, I mean, you go from one car to another, it's completely different. You get a new phone, it doesn't work. There's no consistency whatsoever, and it seems to me like Apple's drawn to things that need consistency that have nothing but chaos. The other thing to understand about this is that it, this just doesn't go one way. Tesla's poached Apple engineers too. You know, Tesla's poached uh, Apple engineers and executives. So um, there's there's friction on both sides of this. It isn't just Apple trying to drain Tesla from smart uh, of smart people. Tesla's grabbing Apple folks too, and. Uh, that that is interesting in and of itself because you know obviously uh, having that feather in your cap, having worked for 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 Apple, uh, 
um, is is going to make you a very attractive hiring uh, ad for uh, companies that are very focused on quality engineering, like Tesla is. So it comes down to yeah, it comes down to having smart, intelligent people who are ready to work hard and work long hours, because those kind of people are in short supply, especially in the valley. Um, so I think any any people that Apple can grab, even if they're not necessarily directly in the primary, like they may not be iOS engineers, but hey, battery tech is something that's very interesting to Apple right now because we've got you know lithium-ion batteries have uh, kind of been the same for the last five, ten years. This, there's a innovation ripe to be made in battery technology, and uh, and in terms of the companies that are potentially poised to do it, Tesla has a has a very big investment in making batteries better, uh, and so does Apple for different but similar reasons. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not surprised to see some back and forth across the aisle. Um, so let's uh. Let's talk a little bit about stuff that's been going on our website. We launched some new columns last week. Uh, we got uh, our experts column that went live on Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday, and this Wednesday we had Stephen Aquino talking about accessibility, which is really cool. Um, tomorrow we're going to have a column from uh, game journalist Maddie Myers on uh, on the plight of the iOS gamer and how you can uh, how you can respect iOS gamers and bring them into the the general gaming fold. Um, and you guys have been running your iOS and Mac help columns for a couple weeks now. I want to talk a little bit about about that. What, what have you guys been getting so far? Um, the general response. Uh, what the most most common problems you've seen? Um, well, I'm getting a lot more questions. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> more than the already a lot, but um, I think the most common ones, ironically, and I, I can't say I didn't really expect it, have to do with things that tie into cellular carriers or service um, storage issues are a huge thing that people uh, email and write and have Hulk rage about. So, um, yeah, I would say storage, cellular issues, those are the things I'm seeing on the iOS side, and those are things that we're definitely going to look at trying to address in many different ways. Absolutely. And what was your column this week? What did you... Um, I think it was a cellular. Uh, people that were having issues sending messages to green bubble people. They oh, weren't... Uh, it seems people. like... And it's, it's iPhone 6 or 6 Plus users that are specifically affected. Um, and this seems to be an issue with Volte, or Voice over LTE, um, which Verizon, AT&T, and some carriers are rolling out. Um, and there's kind of an easy solution to that. Uh, you can just toggle LTE to data only. Um, it seems like in areas where they're expanding to use Voice over LTE, it's causing issues with text messaging and voice calling. So if you're having those issues, toggling that off on a 6 or 6 plus seems to fix it. Or not off, but using LTE for data only, not voice. Um, that seems to fix the problem and messages start coming through again regularly. So again, carrier, woes. Those pesky carriers. Peter, what about you? What's what's going on in the Mac sphere? Well, this week we had a really good question from somebody who's uh, got a, a relative coming over who, as he put it, never met a cl- or never met a link that she didn't like. Um, so he was worried about uh, how to isolate um, her. Uh, uh, computer from the rest of the network, and I introduced him to the concept of setting up a guest network, which you can do on airport expresses of uh, airport extremes and time capsules of relatively recent vintage. I think 2009 and later um, support uh, this ability. So set up a guest network and isolate uh, that traffic from the rest of your network. So, uh, for example, if you've got a relative who loves taking uh, or printing out pictures of cats, well, maybe you don't want to waste that inkjet, which is, you know, more precious than gold. Uh, that inkjet ink cartridge um, on doing that, you can set up a guest network and and isolate their traffic from the rest of your network, so they don't have access to shared resources like printers, file servers, and other things. Um, or, you know, if just for security's sake. So that, that was our question this week. It's interesting. I haven't really noticed any trends yet uh, when it comes to Mac help. They're really kind of all over the map. Uh, people are asking questions about specific software packages. People are asking questions about general um, uh, topics that they need help with. Um, uh, people have questions about stability. You know, is, is Yosemite worth installing and so on? Um, so, you know, a lot of great questions, though, and I hope that people keep them coming. So send them to machelp at imore.com if you've got questions. Machelp and iOS help at imore.com. Is that right? 
That is correct. Right? Sweet. I believe so. Yeah, and another thing to point out too is in our iMore forums, uh, we have a questions thread, and you don't have to register for the forums to do that. You can do it completely anonymously. You can register. We frequently pull questions from there. So, and sometimes our forum users, our regular ones, are much smarter than we are at times. We can say that. Um, it's very almost hard. all the time. So, yeah. And you might actually get an answer there a lot quicker than you would get an answer in a column. So if you're having a severe issue or something that you're, or you're just impatient, um, if you go to forums.imore.com, I think at the top it says, I think it says ask a question. You just uh -huh. click there, you type your question, and you submit it, and someone will answer you, whether it be me, Peter, Ren, I don't know, John Stamos, I don't know. <laughs> Someone one of our, one of our hard-working forum volunteers. Yes. We've got, yeah, we've got a lot of great people in the forums. I've been trying to be more active in the forums myself. It's one of those yeah. things where it's like, generally, the 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 macro forums were always one of those like, oh, danger. But the iMore <laughs> forums are actually like, um, as a lady, iMore forums are actually very nice and very civil, mm -hmm. and I haven't really had any problems. So I'm, you know, that's that's always exciting. Yeah, and um, we don't make you register if you don't want to. You can ask your question without having to give us any data or tell us anything, really. You can submit it, or you can. And then if you do register, you'll receive notifications and all that good stuff if someone responds to you. So. Yeah, it's a relatively troll-free place. Yeah. So, you know, if, if trolls are your concern, don't worry about it too much. We boot the phone. trolls pretty quick. They get in sometimes, but they do not get cookies, and they get booted right out. No cookies. Yeah, I think it was I think it was an old uh, admin of the Macworld forums way back in the day um, described uh, the the right administration technique as iron fist in a velvet glove. <laughs> yes, I like that description a lot. Um, really quickly, uh, talking about a couple of new apps that well apps and up updates that are, are coming out this week uh, busy contacts just launched um, from Chaffee who's done busy Cal of course which uh, I used for a long time and I know a lot of people swear by um, I haven't had a chance to, to try out busy contacts yet but I know there's been betas floating around and uh, and people seem to like it a lot if you're if managing your contacts is, is what you're really into have either of you given it a, a whirl yet? I just fired it up actually um, because it just released today so I was installing it um, about an hour ago and I haven't really gotten too far into it yet but you know BusyCal is a heck of a great calendar uh, application so having um, an app that is complementary to it and integrates some of its capabilities is is great you know Busy Contacts works um, uh, with uh, your existing contact database, it'll uh, integrate well with iCloud. It also works with other calendaring, I mean, uh, contact uh, stuff as well. So, you know, if you um, uh, manage contacts through Facebook or uh, through a CalDAV server, uh, BusyCal will integrate with those as well. So, um, really looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and finding out what this can do. Yeah, um, I'm really excited to kind of get around and play with it. And Allie, I know you're excited about another app update that's coming out today. Workflow 1.1 is coming out with um, yep. with some nice improvements. Um, I'm really psyched about this. I've kind of gotten addicted to Workflow, and I may have inadvertently gotten you addicted to it as well. There just there are so many cool things you can do with it, eh? Yeah, I'm been trying to find ways to get it to make me dinner. <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out yet, but I'm it sure it can't it'll integrate with robots yet. It might yeah, be the keyword. Exactly. But, um, yeah, I've been addicted to workflow. Um, I got my girlfriend. I told her, I said, it can order pizza for you. No matter where you are, you can just tap order pizza, and it will find pizza places around you, and you can just tap to dial one of them. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it can do all kinds of different things. Uh, you can make gifts. You can do. I, I, you can probably set up a script. I think uh, your, which we'll talk about in a second, ways to pester people with iMessage. I think there's even a script in there to spam people with emoji. There so, is. Yeah. I don't know of a better reason. I immediately clicked on that. So um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, workflow has a lot of really great. Uh, workflows already in there, actions in there, and uh, there are more added all the time. So I'm waiting for someone to just start a forum that's dedicated to nothing but workflow. Yeah, there's a there's a pretty good subreddit right now that's dealing with I that. saw that one, yeah. Yeah. 
But I know um, the goal is, we've gotten a bit sidetracked with Apple News, but uh, I might start highlighting some awesome workflows on Thursdays, fingers crossed, as well as some intro tips for people who are really excited about uh, getting into workflow and learning it. It is, you know, it is a scriptable platform. It is, you know, it, uh, but I don't want people to get like frightened by that because I know I look at Apple Script uh, sometimes and I'm just like, oh God, I don't, I, I can't. I can't even mm -hmm. think about this. But um, workflow, I feel like, is much more intuitive. It's much friendlier for people who've never done scripting before. And actually, it's a lot of fun learning how to build your own scripts when you're like, yeah. hey, I wonder if this could do this. And you're not really going to, especially on iOS, you're not really going to break anything. So it's all sandboxed, it, yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't hurt to just kind of add some things and you know try some things out and see what happens. I think the worst thing I ever did was the app crashed on me because I did something stupid that shouldn't have been there. I don't know. But, Alex, I mean, infinite number of emojis. Yeah, that might have been it. Or I tried to spam Peter with cat memes or something. I don't <laughs> know. Didn't like it. But yeah, I mean, and you can do simple little things like I have a, you know, email template set up. So when I email certain groups of people, instead of having to go in and create and add 10 people, I just have a script where I can tap email I'm more staff or email newsroom or whatever. And I can easily do that in one tap instead of having to add all those people or manage groups anymore. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it makes it, life a lot easier. Agreed. It's really awesome. Um, so definitely check out Workflow if you have not had a chance. Um, have you guys found, I know, Allie, you reviewed a really awesome tripod that I happen to also own and love this week. Um, I, is that something that you want to talk about at all on the show? Um, we can for a second. Um, so it's not necessarily an iPhone accessory, but it can be. Um, it's the Mi Photo Tripod series. I went with the Road Trip series, which I think is kind of a happy medium. They have smaller tripods and then larger tripods that are geared more towards um, pro photographers that might have bigger full-frame cameras. I don't think the Road Trip would be good for like a full-frame larger camera, but it's good for mid-size to small full-frame cameras. Um, so I took this on our European adventures and I've used it with my iPhone as well. They sell an accessory called a Sidekick 360 and they just released a new version called a 360 Plus, which fits phones like the Note 3 and uh, the iPhone 6 Plus, obviously. Um, the nice thing that I like about these tripods as far as, especially with the Sidekick 360 mount, is you get that... Um, and you have one, the ball joint on that tripod is it's so awesome. nice. It is so smooth. I've had so many different tripods and for the price point that that, I think they're like what? 180? Yeah. They're not, they're not bad at all. On Amazon for like 160. I got the aluminum version. Um, I think the carbon fiber version is like 300 and some dollars. Um, the aluminum is really light. Like, I feel like that's light enough for me. I have no problem carrying that around. I would be interested to see how light the carbon fiber is. Um, but a point comparison, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it's just, it's very well made, and the ball joint on that tripod is just, it's so smooth. You can pan, you can, it's to the point where I've gotten lazy to where if, like, I'm not completely balanced or, you know, if it, I, I'm not exactly level, I'll just use the ball joint to make up for it because, I mean, it's just that easy to use. And the Sidekick 360 attachment has a very similar ball head in it for $49. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I like that a lot better for iPhoneography than, like, my little desk tripod or, you know, using one that I have to screw a attachment onto, so. Yeah, it's yeah. a... I've I've been liking mine. Um, I got mine about a month and a half ago for CES related stuff and and just miscellaneous. Uh, I think the first day I got it, I ended up shooting a, a hero image for the site uh, because I didn't have someone else to take the photo for me. So I'm 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 really digging it. Peter, you got yeah. anything that you're testing right now that you really like? Hmm. Anything that I'm testing right now that I really like? Um. The the latest thing that I've been playing with actually is um, the uh, Ultimate Ears Mega Boom, um, which is a, uh, a portable speaker. I don't have it handy. I was just looking around to see if I've got it within arm's reach. I don't. Uh, but it, it just came out uh, around CES time, and uh, it's a Bluetooth speaker uh, that produces an amazing amount of punch. Um, they... Uh, 
Uh, Ultimate Ears uh, makes some really great stuff. If you're looking for a relatively affordable um, uh, uh, speaker that that really um, uh, kicks it up a notch, uh, this is this is definitely a good choice. Um, checking prices right now, it looks like it's around three hundred dollars, so it's in that that Bose um, category. Um, uh, just very nice, uh, very rich sound, room filling, uh, but portable. Uh, you can uh, walk around with it, uh, put it in whatever room you want, and uh, um, don't think about it afterwards. That's exciting. Nice. Yeah. You mentioned, too, we're going to be taking a look at uh, these fitness band type things over the next several weeks. Uh, so right now I'm messing with the Fitbit Surge, which is touchscreen. Oh, I've nice. Yeah, so kind of doing, we'll be looking at those like really in depth at this point. Um, so a review of each probably. So um, Fitbit Surge is, I've been using this one this week and uh, this is, it does your, this is the first year I've actually seen them that do your heart rate. They do a lot better on um, anyone who spends time in a gym. One of the pain points with trackers has always been um, stationary equipment. They there's mm -hmm. not really a way to measure because you're not really Steps, you're yeah. moving, but you're not moving. So heart rate kind of helps with that. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it changes from what we looked at last year. For sure. Do you think any of these uh, devices have any longevity uh, with Apple users once the Apple Watch comes out? Um, I think yes, because there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to want to spend what an Apple Watch costs. So, or are they, they, yeah, if they just if they just want to track specific things and they're not maybe interested in anything fancy, they don't want a customized trainer or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't remember, did Apple even say anything about price points with the Apple uh, I Watch? I think 349 is where the sport is going to start. Yeah, and like, I mean, this is like the upper model of a, I think the, the Charge HR, the one Fitbit offers is less, but I think these retail for like 150 so, I mean, you're talking a pretty big difference. So people that are only concerned with fitness, that might be a better option still, I think. I have to say, I've never spent $350 on a watch in my life. You know, I'm not one of these people who likes fancy watches. I never know? have either. So it's going to be very interesting to me to see how the Apple Watch is received. I'm sure that Apple's going to sell millions of them, but to whom, I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, for me, it's one of those things where I've never spent $350 on a watch, although my sister has, um, but I've definitely spent much more than that on my Apple products before. And the idea of having something that is super portable and allows me to keep my phone in its pocket is probably worth a lot of money to me, at least personally. I, I guess I, the reason I'm asking about you know Apple Watch versus fitness bands is because it, it, I, I know studies have shown that people who buy fitness bands the majority of them don't use them for longer than about six months or so. Uh, why? Why isn't is it, why why isn't the sticky band or the the uh, the fitness band as sticky as some other consumer technology might be? I think that that might go back to. I think there's probably more to it than technology there, and maybe that having a half life and more. If you stop going to the gym and you stop doing things that you should be doing? Are you going to wear a fitness band that reminds you of that every day? I don't know. Good point. That, that could be part of the problem, too. So, I, I don't know. I think that's... Fitness bands are more on a personal level, too. I don't particularly like wearing things around my wrist, so typically that's my problem. Um, and if I take it off, like, I do a lot better with the ones that are waterproof. If I can wear it all the time and not have to take it off, there's a less of a chance. Because once I take it off, I'm going to forget to put it back on. And I do that consistently with these, which makes it kind of hard for me to test them sometimes because I set them down and then I don't put it back on. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm still worried about the connotation the Apple Watch will have. And I don't know. I just know if I can, I briefly used a Pebble for a while. And the reaction I would get from people is I'd have my phone in my pocket and I kept looking at my watch and their question was, do you have somewhere to be? It's like, that's kind of, I, I don't know. So I could see it being just as distracting as it can be with a phone. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of worried about the effect that that will have on some people. Because I know some people that can't set their phone down for 10 minutes and it's obnoxious. So those people, I hope, don't get Apple Watches. Yeah, well, we'll see how it shakes out. I mean, the Apple Watch is going to come, um, you know, later <laughs> later this year. Uh, so it's, uh, 
we'll, we'll know pretty quickly. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to close, I'll talk about the the silly article that uh, that I yes. posted today, which is uh, ten ten tricks uh, to what what did I call it? Delight and pester, pester. your uh, your iMessage friends. So uh, this this all gets started. This is all Ali's fault, basically. This this <laughs> article. <laughs> yeah. So I was messing around with iMessage. I don't know, a couple weeks ago, and I was just kind of thumbing through, like, the options, and we have a thread with uh, myself, Ren, Peter, and Renee, which is supposed to be used for work purposes that Renee, you know, chastises us for, for using for other purposes frequently. So I started looking at thread names, and I was curious as to if I change the name of a thread, does it change it for everyone, or does it just change it for me? And we kind of stumbled across the fact that it changes it for everyone. So um, that led into, you know, just thread names being completely random and hilarious, and then we started kind of, I think Ren got the idea to kind of dig and see, hmm. And I think that led into GIFs. That led into all all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple. When I, originally I was just going to write up a tip on that, and I'm like, you know what, I can make this article a little bit beefier. And I put out a general call on Twitter being like, is there anything that people do that you're, you know, um, that annoy you or, or make you laugh. And I got, of course, the usual one, the never-ending texting gif, which is pretty funny. It's not, you know, not entirely accurate because you see, like, the little the little uh, speech bubble rather than the dot, dot, dot thinking <laughs> bubble. But most people aren't going to notice, and it's still really funny. Um, then uh, my, my gentleman friend does emoji stories a lot uh, where he takes uh, emoji and basically does uh, frame by frame like zoetrope type uh, stories and I was like that's really funny I can include that and then we just we just got crazy out of control Dave Addy who's a who's a guy um, former software engineer I think now works at Apple suggested doing text adventures which I thought was fantastic um, you know in case you ever want to reenact Zork with your friends so I made a I made a list of all of these uh, quick type poetry it's just it's a lot of fun and of course I've gotten several people including uh, including my old boss Jason Snell sending me trolling messages now like oh thanks for giving me all these tools Serenity <laughs> and voice notes audio notes just opened up a whole new door to iMessage trolling I have friends that use it seriously and then I have friends that I know do not hit play in a public place so <laughs> Yeah, I kind of love just, that. Yeah, you just learn to know which friends have crossed that line and which ones don't. Yeah, but um, yeah, and I would have to say that everyone should check out that article and do number ten. <laughs> number ten is great. I know I'm a little asking, surprise. Yeah, it is a little surprise. There's a number that you should text, and it's 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 delightful and G-rated, and and will make you smile. I promise. <laughs> All right. Now, now I'm interested. Yeah. And, oh, and the poetry. Like... <laughs> Autocorrect is fun, too. I've done that a couple times with people where you just kind of, whatever, if you have the little quick type bar and you're running iOS 8, you can basically just let iMessage kind of start taking over what you're typing. So start typing a sentence and only use one of the three words that <laughs> Autocorrect gives you and see what kind of sentences you get. Yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> I I've been testing these out a lot. Uh, my messages is kind of <laughs> my my folder is kind of ridiculous at this point of of various uh, playing Connect Four with emoji, all kinds of crazy stuff. But I definitely recommend trying at least one of those uh, to to lighten uh, to brighten up your iMessage conversations to to make mm -hmm. them more fun. Yep, and um, you've got some apps in there that have lots of good resources for GIFs and mm -hmm. uh, workflow links to that fancy... Never ending app. emoji. Thanks, Mike Curly. I'm so sorry. <laughs> now everybody's going to blame you for their significant others getting a zillion poop emojis. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, do, you, do either of you have anything that you want to close out with? Otherwise, I think we, uh, we might be just at our hour. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah no, I'm good on my end. All right. Well, that was that was the week in brief. Um, <laughs> here from us at iMore. Renee will be back next week, probably back in the frigid uh, northeast of Montreal. Uh, until then, he is going to be enjoying the lovely Californian weather, and we all hate him for it just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Come back and enjoy our suffering, Renee. Um, until then, I am Serenity Caldwell. You can find me at Saturn on all of the things and on iMore.com. Allie? 
I am at iMuggle on all of the social things and every day on iMore. And Peter! I am at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H, and of course at iMore. And if Rene were here, he would tell you that he is at Rene Ritchie and also on iMore and wandering around Cupertino this week. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Our sponsor today was Harry's. Uh, thank you very much. They're a shaving company. They're super rad. I'm going to do a more detailed read as soon as we close this up. Um, but uh, for the 23 of you who tuned in to 24 of you who tuned in for the, for the whole thing, uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you for listening to us ramble, and we'll see you next week. See ya.